Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen McBroom, and I'm a docent at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I am delighted to be able to join your celebration of One Book, One Community 2021, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Today, I thought I would share some pieces of art with you from the Detroit Institute of Arts collection that share some of the themes that Britt Bennett explores in her wonderful book. So let's get going right away. And let's look at this first uh, piece that's going to kind of go back to the very beginning of the Vanishing Half, Mallard, 1848, when it was first founded. So what do we have here? Well, we have a still life with fruit. And we look at it and we notice that right center, there's a nice plump pineapple. All around it, we've got some other exotic fruits. There's a mango in there. There's a papaya. It looks like there are some kind of exotic looking berries, all spread out in a pretty tight formation, all things considered, on a table. We see the tablecloth down in front, and then up here in the corners, we kind of have it presented in a proscenium style, like it really is a, a quite a production. Well, this is fruit piece. And this was painted in 1849 by Robert Selden Duncanson. Robert Selden Duncanson was an artist of African and Scottish descent. And he actually lived in Monroe for quite a while when he was a young man. He painted this painting. And if you notice, it, the fruit is arranged exactly in, in a very tight formation. All right. It's not like some of those paintings you may have seen Oh, from the Dutch masters where there's just a profusion of food spilling across the table. The message of this piece was more of restraint and control. But something needs to be said. In 1849, these fruits, especially the pineapple, would have been unheard of luxuries. How would any artist ever come to, you know, have the chance to paint these? Well, Let's go into some background. As I said, Robert Selden Duncanson was a free man of color. And in the 1840s in the United States, you were either enslaved or you were free. Robert Selden Duncanson was free, just like Alphonse, the twins' great-grandfather who founded Mallard. Um, that doesn't mean his life was easy though. Um, as a free man of color, he could not go to college, he could not go to school, he could not go to art school, he could not um, attend any kind of classes, he could not exhibit. I mean, he pretty much was excluded from a lot of things. Um, so it usually happened in situations like this when you had someone with prodigious talent, as Robert did, he, his, his family were house painters, and um, his talent became very apparent when he was a very young man. So his education and his career was taken over by sympathetic abolitionists. And one of the families who worked with him, and by this I mean they got him tutors, they bought him art supplies, and then they gave him commissions so that he would be able to paint, was an importer of exotic fruit in Cincinnati. So in this particular case, they even gave him his subject matter. On a side note, Duncanson submitted this painting, Fruit Piece, to the Michigan State Fair in 1849, and he won first prize. He won the blue ribbon. It's safe to say that there's absolutely no way that he would have won had the judges known that he was a free man of color. If we take a look at this, that fruit piece was pretty early in Duncanson's career. Look at this, painted in 1871, one year before Duncanson passed away. Talk about a master of landscape. Look particularly at the sun and the rays up here in the sky. Look how he's captured the reflection of the sun, both on the clouds and then look down below the sun as it's reflected on the lake in this beautiful, beautiful setting. This is Ellen's Isle in Loch Katrine, which is in Scotland. And this was a very, very popular and famous tourist spot. Um, there had been a poem written about the Arthurian legend, and if some of you are up on your King Arthur, excuse me, Arthur, you might remember that 
Lac Vitrine was where the Lady of the Lake supposedly gave the sword Excalibur to King Arthur. Well, this had been celebrated in poems. And this, as I said, was a very, very popular tourist spot. And so Duncanson eventually became so famous and so well known for his paintings that he traveled um, to England and then spent a long time in France. And then he went back and spent some time in Scotland where he painted this scene. And you can see there's a little boat, a canoe down in the left-hand corner. Those are actually tourists. There's another small boat just kind of coming around the bend of the island in the background. And you can see all the lush greenery and the perfect calm and just the serenity. Well, the famed intellectual African-American writer, W.E.B. D. Du Bois, Du Bois, also knew about the poem and knew about this painting and when Du Bois saw this painting, he made a statement about how he just wished that in the future, the United States would look this nice and this beautiful and would be a pristine Eden where everyone was welcome. And here we have a photograph of Robert Selden Duncanson. And he had a studio in Detroit and he stayed in Michigan most of his life. And he spent some time in Cincinnati as well. And just one last story is that when Duncanson passed away, he was buried in an unmarked grave down on his family's property in Monroe. And then just a couple of years ago in 2019, the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club took up a collection and they, they made enough money so that they made a very proper memorial. So now Robert Selden Duncanson, who was celebrated as not just one of the best free men of color landscape artists, but one of the best American landscape artists of the mid 19th century has a proper grave. So this, this, these are the experiences of a free man of color. What about contemporary woman? All right, but let's look at these two pieces. So what do we have here? Well, we have two white marble busts. Over on the left, we have Minnehaha, and on the right, we have Hiawatha. Now, if those names are familiar to you, they should be. They come out of a poem, a very famous poem, that was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1855. So here we have Edmonia Lewis, who made these in 1868. And Edmonia was born in 1844. If we look at Minnehaha over on the left, we can see that she's wearing a headband and she has a feather and she's wearing a robe that might maybe be made out of fur or something, but we might also notice that she seems to be wearing a string of pearls and that her features would appear to be more, more classic than Native American. She was allegedly of the Dakota people, but she's been shown to us as a very proper marble bust. If we look over at Hiawatha, who is of the Ojibwa people, we see that he too has his hair pulled back. He has feathers, he's wearing a headdress. He's wearing some kind of a necklace that has some kind of ornaments on them. And he's got maybe a, a blanket thrown over one shoulder. But again, they both look like they could have come back from ancient classical Roman Greece. So what's going on here? Well, as I said, the poem um, Minnehaha and Hiawatha was an international sensation. It was hugely popular in the United States and in Europe. And um, it tells a story about how these two Native Americans, one from the Ojibwa tribe and one from the Dakota tribe, fell in love. And even though their people had traditionally been warriors, their love affair brought peace and brought it back together. This was incredibly, incredibly popular. The artist, though, has an interesting story herself. Um, Mary Edmonia Lewis, born in 1844, was um, of mixed heritage. Her mother was an Ojibwa Native American and her father was a free man of color who had come to the United States from Haiti. And Edmonia had a very hard life. She was orphaned as a child. Um, Luckily, she had an older half-brother, though, who had struck it rich in the gold strike out west, and he paid to send her to Oberlin College, probably the only college in America at the time that would accept a free woman of color with Native American heritage as well. 
Edmonia had a terrible time. She had to drop out of school. She had to kind of find, wander around the world until she finally found a home in Rome. And in Rome, she became known as an amazing sculptor. Now, Edmonia was only four foot 10 and she was a woman. And women didn't work in marble. It was just, it was considered a man's occupation. But Edmonia did indeed work in marble. And the two busts that we saw, those are just small samples of her work. She was internationally known. She did a bust of President Grant. She has larger than life uh, sculptures that you can find throughout the United States. But Edmonia also found that she could not live in the United States. She would not have been free to practice her trade. She would have faced just ongoing discrimination. And so she spent her entire life in Rome. So this, you know, free people of color did exist, but their, their existence was so precarious. And I mean, if you think back what happened to Leon when, when the mob just broke into their house and, you know, lynched him in front of his girls, free people of color always never knew, never knew that they were safe 100%. They always had to be on their guard. Well, let's jump forward a little bit, all right? Here we have a profoundly different sculpture than what we were just looking at with Minnehaha and Hiawatha. I mean, look at this. Here we have, it looks like a young boy, and he has, obviously, he has African-American features. He looks like the normalest kid you might not find on the street. And indeed, that's the name of this, gamin, which is a French word, which means street urchin, which means like street kid, all right? And when you look at this, Here's a young African-American boy. He's just wearing regular clothes and he's probably got his prized possession on his head. That would be his bebop cap. That would have been all the rage in about 1930. Well, this is a sculpture and this was made by another woman. This was made by Augusta Savage and she was African-American. And like uh, the girls who were born in Texas, she was born down south, only she was born in Florida in 1905. And as a young girl, Augusta was always getting in trouble because she couldn't keep her hands off of clay. She was always playing with clay, both at home and at school. And of course that red Florida clay got all over her clothes. And as I said, she was always in trouble. So she didn't get much support at home. So like the twins, she decided to take off. Only she got married. She was 15, about the same age as the girls. She and her husband moved up to New York City and they moved into Harlem and Augusta thought that she had died and gone to heaven. There were museums, there were art galleries, there she could take art lessons, she could do all sorts of things. And do you remember in the book, at, at, before the girls took off, Stella had gone on a Saturday. She'd gone to the South Louisiana Museum on a regular day, not, not even on a Negro Saturday day. And she had gone in, she had passed. And even though the guard winked at her because he recognized her, remember just that, that urge to see art. And here Augusta for the first time in her life found Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance was just starting and found acceptance for what she was doing. Now, this statue that you're looking at right now that we own, it looks like it's made out of bronze, but it's not. This is actually painted plaster. Why? Well, yes, the Harlem Renaissance was taking off in 1930. But don't forget, it was also the Depression, and it was very difficult. You know, metal was very, very expensive. But Augusta Savage devoted her entire life to teaching. Um, she was a marvelous sculptor, and as I said, she has got uh, pieces all over the world and the United States. Um, but she also taught at the Harlem um, Art Community Center. She taught generations and generations of kids. And this photograph I just love, because here we see Augusta with one of her creations, and it's the statue of a little fawn. And a fawn, of course, is a mythological creature who is half goat and half human. And if you look, you can, you can see his kind of hairy leg going down and his little, you know, hooved um, foot at the bottom. But again, look at the features on this child. This child is obviously African-American. He's got the curly hair 
And I just, the way it looks, I know it's not true, but it just looks like Augusta and the fawn are just beaming at each other. And Augusta Savage always said that that was at what she wanted her legacy to be, that she was a ta uh, had taught children generation after generation after generation not only to appreciate art, but to know that they could do art just like anybody else. Up in Harlem, I mean, this is a photograph that was taken by a very famous African-American photographer, James Van Der Zee, who lived and worked in Harlem and who almost always, well, first of all, he documented middle-class African-American art, um, African-American life, which this whole you know, middle class was beginning to emerge because it was such a diaspora out of the South, the Great Migration, people living the South and the Jim Crow laws and coming North and finding work. And here we have a sample of this. Normally, James Van Der Zee invited his subjects to come back to his studio where he had all sorts of props. But in this situation, obviously, he went out and he took a, a picture of this couple. They've got their raccoon uh, coats on and they're standing in front of a brand new Cadillac. This uh, picture is also known as Cadillac. And they seem to be in a very middle-class neighborhood. So again, there was an emerging um, African-American middle-class, um, but unfortunately, I don't think the word had gotten back to Mallard too much. And here we have a photograph of James Van Der Zee with a quote, sometimes the photographs seem to be more valuable to me than they did to the people I was photographing because I put my heart and soul into them. And because he put his heart and soul into them, we have a record of the emerging African-American middle class that was going on. Here is the Piper. And this was painted in 1953 by Huey Lee Smith. And when we look at this, we see two themes that Huey Lee Smith put into almost all of his paintings. First of all, look at the setting. We appear to be in some urban area that has probably seen better days. You see the brick wall in the background. It's those small bricks, much smaller than the ones we're used to seeing in today's construction. At some point, it looks like someone tried to plaster over the brick and that didn't take. The brick is falling down. We see some crumbles and stuff on the ground. We can see some letters there, posts, no bills, penalty of law, even that's fading. There's a pillar over there on the right side. That's gouged and it's got some dents in it. Looks like it's got, it can be a piece of wire wrapped around it. Maybe some electrical wire has fallen down shadow doorway in the background and it looks pretty worn and if we look at the ground there's a little piece of litter seems to be blowing past and then over on the left side look at the shadow all right that indicates that uh we're in a really narrow narrow street or maybe even an alleyway i mean if that other shadow of the building is there and then of course we have the young boy right there just staring right out at us. Looks like he's wearing a bebop hat too. Just a direct gaze and he's playing a musical instrument. Now I don't know how many of you played recorders in music class maybe when you were in elementary school. They tend to be plastic. They tend to be very very inexpensive. And here we have this very earnest young man staring right at us and playing away. So What's going on here? Well, Huey Lee Smith was another African-American who fled the South. He was born in Florida, just like Augusta Savage was. And he and his family first went to Atlanta and then they moved to Cleveland. And if you remember in the book, Sam, who was Desiree's husband, he had grown up in the Cleveland projects. And Huey Lee Smith wasn't exactly in the projects. He was more out in the middle class area, but he was living with his grandmother who was very, very strict. And he always felt like he was isolated. And so in his, in his paintings, he, he likes to explore the theme of isolation. He said he was often alone, but not always lonely. And the other theme was the urban decay. A lot of the people who came up from the South, a lot of African-Americans 
found themselves living in urban areas that had pretty much been abandoned. And that's, that's pretty much where they wound up living. Now, one more side note on this painting, The Piper, is that Hughie Lee Smith entered this into a contest that was sponsored by the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1953, and he won first prize for this. And when he, you know, they had the award ceremony, he talked about how when you look at the boy and you think about he's playing this, this little flute, this little recorder, and he's playing a melody. And think about a melody and the notes, the noise, the, the, you know, the tune would float up into the air and float away. And that's what he wanted to portray in this painting, the hope that this young man can transcend his surroundings and maybe float away and go on to bigger and better things. And here's a portrait of Huey Lee Smith that he painted in 1964, because after Huey Lee Smith left Cleveland, he moved to Detroit and he went to school at both what is now the College for Creative, Centers, Creative Studies and Wayne State, and he wound up teaching at Wayne State. And as I said, he painted this portrait in 1964 and it's almost a shame because he was a very kind, very gentle man who had a lot to do with nurturing um, young artists here in the Detroit area. Well, let's jump ahead a little bit. Um, now we're into the 1960s. This would be just about the time Jude was born. And 1960s, of course, was a time of great upheaval. I mean, there was all, I mean, this was re reflected in the book as well. Um, Sam and uh, Stella, uh, I'm sorry, Sam and Desiree were living in Washington, D.C. There, there, there was, Stella was accosted. There were all sorts of things going on. Um, and what happened in 1963, actually 1964, was when the Civil Rights Act was passed, which was supposed to bring about an end to desegregation of schools. So what do we have here? Southern Pasture, 1963, painted by Benny Andrews. Okay, so we have, well, first of all, if we were down at the museum and you could see this in person, you would, under, you would see this is a collage. This is not a painting you would be able to see that the mother's dress is actually made of cloth that has been attached to the, um, the palette, to the, the painting itself. The little girl's dress is made of cloth. The leaves of the tree are made of different types of material that are coming out. And you would see that the buckles on the mom's shoe are actual buckles. So we see a mom and a little girl, probably a mother and a daughter, and they're reaching towards a tree, tree of knowledge perhaps. And yet, if you look, you can see there's barbed wire strung across the painting, separating the mother and the girl from the tree of knowledge. And this is a pretty gentle take on the fact that maybe there was legislation and maybe on paper it existed that education was going to be equitable but we still have a long way to go and that African Americans had an awful lot of battles they had to overcome. And if you look closely, like down here on the mother's ankle and things, you can see that this truly is a collage and made up of all sorts of different material that was put together. And um, Benny Andrews himself was quite an activist. As I said, that's a very mild um, painting that he did. But he was a teacher as well. And so many of um, the artists that I'm featuring today uh, were African-Americans who taught and gave back to their community. They were all about um, raising everyone up and, and bringing everyone along with them on their trip. Now here we have a much more disturbing uh, painting. And uh, this is called The Fire Next Time. It was painted in 1968 by Vincent Smith. And we see here we have four men who are fleeing some kind of conflagration. We don't know for sure what it is, but it seems to be fire and it seems to be maybe explosions going on. And it definitely gives us the feeling of great 
danger and, and great turmoil. And if you look at the men going across, you can see that each one has a pretty different reaction. The gentleman over here putting on his black glasses, uh, it's almost like he can't stand to see it. He can't bear to see it. He's not going to look at it. He's putting on the glasses because he can't believe it. This man, oops, I'm sorry. The second man over has his head down as if he's in despair. He can't believe what's going on. The third man with his mouth open in that horrible grimace, he, I think, shows the absolute terror. Uh, the red stripes on his shirt mimic the fire in the background. He is just you know, showing us how horrible it would be to be in a situation like this. And then, of course, the gentleman on the end just has a very thoughtful, pensive worry, like, where is this going to end? What's going to happen? And I think that Vincent Smith does such a good job about bringing up what's, what's, you know, what's going on in the country at that time. And the fire next time, of course, refers to a book by James Baldwin that had been written long before the 60s came along where he predicted studies as well. And what do we have here? Little Girl Blue. This is the story of Stephanie's cousin who was murdered in Detroit back in the 1960s. And when you look at it, it's kind of like a triptych, all right? You see, there's definitely one scene here, and then there's kind of a division here. It's not quite as noticeable. But there's so much going on in this painting. So let's take a look at it together. So this little girl in the center is Stephanie's cousin. Over here, we see her mom you know, stirring up something to eat. This is a picture of her cousin when she was a baby. And this is, this is her on her 13th birthday. And then this is her after she was murdered. And what are all these symbols? Well, whenever you see fruit, and we have a lot of pears, they seem to be the balloons that this little boy is pulling along. There's some others over here. And there's a couple apples over here. Fruit is the international symbol. It's a reminder that life is short and that death is coming. You know, what happens to fruit? Well, after a while, it gets ripe and then it gets overripe and, you know, it, life ends. Up here, we have Humpty Dumpty. And what is Humpty Dumpty? An egg. And what is more fragile than an egg? Human life, all right? We have a baby doll up here who appears to be riddled with red dots. Are those gunshots an end of innocence? We see down here a lot of black birds. In African-American culture and several other cultures, black birds, black birds are the sign of impending death. It's a warning. And then of course, over here, we see Stephanie Jackson's cousin. If any of you have seen paintings from the Renaissance of martyred martyrs who were shot through with arrows, Stephanie's cousin is posed in that exact same pose with bullet holes to her body and she's up against a target as if her end was inevitable. And then finally, who is this little boy over here running away with two masks on? That is Stephanie Jackson's nephew. He came home from school and discovered his mother's body on the kitchen floor. So of course the two faces show before and after. So this whole scene is a tribute that Stephanie Jackson made, Little Girl Blue, in honor of her cousin talking about just the danger and just, you know, urban life and just the uncertainty of everyday life. This is a picture of Stephanie Jackson. She currently is a teacher um, down in the South, but she does come back to Detroit to visit her family on a regular basis. And you will sometimes find her roaming around the Detroit Institute of Arts. This next picture, after that last picture, I wanted to share this one with you because this is an entirely different message. In this one, we see Queen Mother Helen Moore. 
And the name Helen Moore may be familiar to some of you because Helen Moore has been a long time um, activist on behalf of the children of Michigan and the children of Detroit. And she's uh, also been a long time community activist. And here we see her gazing out at us, very straightforward, proud. And she's clutching photos of her two sons and her grandsons, all college graduates. And the painter of this is Mario Moore. Oops, I'm sorry. And this is Mario Moore right here. This is his father over here. And this is his uncle. All right. And um, Mario Moore painted this in 2015 because he said he wanted to paint something that was different than the media portrayals of all of these African-American mothers holding the bodies of their dead sons and grandsons and weeping over their children that had been killed due to police violence. And he painted this back in 2015. And here we have a picture of Mario and his mother. Uh, um, that's Helen over on the left, obviously, and in 2017 when Helen Moore and Mario Moore. And the painting itself, Mario painted it on a copper background and that helps to bring out the color and the nuances. And I just think it's such a strong and uplifting and kind of a happy ending, um, which you could argue that there's pretty happy ending at the end of The Vanishing Half. Let's talk about one other theme though that's very, very strong in The, in the um, Vanishing Half. And that is the whole idea of colorism. I mean, um, Britt Bennett really explores the whole idea in the African-American culture about light is better and black is dark and how, you know, you never marry dark and so on and so forth. And um, I'm thinking about poor Jude. You know, the book opens with her, you know, coming back to town with her mom and the people in the diner, Lou's diner, are talking about that, look, she's blue back. This looks like she's flown directly here from Africa. Later on in the book, there are words like, um, she felt like a fly in milk, you know, contaminating everything. And there's one interchange between Jude and Kennedy uh, where, where, you know, uh, Jude says, you know, they don't like people like me. And Kennedy says, blacks you mean. And Jude says, no, dark ones like me, the light ones are fine. And Kennedy just laughs. Well, that's silly. Well, Kennedy obviously didn't understand it. But Jude understood it and Desiree understood it and Stella certainly understood it. So here's a painting that kind of explores um, the whole concept. Change your luck, all right? Change your luck is a vernacular expression um, that is sometimes used when an African-American man starts dating or seeing a white woman. And Change Your Luck is the name of this painting that was painted by Robert Cole Scott in 1988. Now, whoops, when we look at this, we can see there are all sorts of um, symbols for luck coming from all sorts of cultures. Voodoo, Christianity, common folklore. I mean, up here at the top, we have a horseshoe. We've got some cards. We've got um, a black cat. We have a um, dice down here at the bottom. We have um, a blacksmith. And in some cultures, blacksmiths are thought to have supernatural powers. All right. Um, we've got a voodoo doll up here who's been pierced. We've got all sorts of things going on. Change your luck. Um, this man over here has got four-leaf clovers on his shirt. But look at the main person. His skin is mottled. Is he black or is he white? I mean, does it matter? Up here, we have this person who may be black or white, definitely with a black woman, but then down here, we have a white woman. Over here, we have this poor individual whose facial expression would seem to indicate to us um, just the despair and the futility of it all, of trying to change your luck. So th this, this is kind of a take on colorism and, and going back and forth and, you know, aspiring for things that maybe you can't have. This next piece, oh, there's Robert Cole Scott underneath another one of his um, pieces. But this next box, um, piece 
which uh, is made out of found objects made by Betty Sartre, speaks to the whole idea of colorism specifically. Um, what do we see here? All right. Well, we see an old picture frame and Betty Sarr, the artist who made this, often would use picture frames to frame her pieces. That's how she got started making um, art out of found objects. She go to flea markets or wherever she could go to find things that other people had discarded because she felt that objects brought along stories with them and she loved giving them new life. So we have a picture frame here. And then right in the center, we have a woman, whoops, sorry again, woman looking out at us directly, gazing directly at us. And she is very, very dark and she's against a very dark background. And even though there's that bright blue, we can tell it's dark, it's midnight. And this woman just gazing at us intently. Then she's surrounded, there's this like black piece. It's actually made out of um, metal. It's like a piece of metallic lace. And that is that is kind of covering the part of her face where normally it would be, kind of like a call, C-A-U-L, a call. And in African-American culture and African culture, Native American culture for that matter, in several, several cultures, it's believed that if a baby is born with a call over the face, and the call is part of the um, membrane, if a baby is born with the call over their face, they have supernatural powers. They are much more in touch with the spirit world than regular people. So we have the symbol of the call. This woman is framed here by these four sticks. Those are diviner sticks. Those are sticks that fortune tellers would throw down. They're going to read your fortune. Down here at the bottom, we have the hand. The hand can justify reading the palm, of course. It can, uh, it's a symbol for hoodoo and voodoo, which has to do with the black hand coming down from the sky, being summoned. We see down here that we have a series of like locks and keys. Here's another little lock over here. Those are important to unlock the secrets of the universe. If we continue around the outside of the frame over here, we have two snakes that are intertwined. That is a voodoo symbol. Going up here, we have a moon and a star and the crescent moon going across just the phases of the moon. Up here, we have a Christian religious medallion, it looks like, and over here we have a crucifix. Here we have some birds, and birds, of course, are always thought to be mystical. In several um, cultures believe that because birds can fly from the ground where us humans are, and they can go up to the sky, they can go up and they can contact the ancestors up on high. Up here on top, we have a black magician's hat. Um, Sorry, I keep doing that. Right here, we've got the yin and yang, good and evil. I don't know if you can see or not. This is a sphinx. And, and just is all, we've got two little skulls over here. So we have all sorts of um, superstitious objects again, just like in Change Your Luck. And they're hoodoo, voodoo, Christianity, magic, black magic, it all comes together. And so what Betty Starr is doing here is she is talking about the power of women, the power of black women, the power of women who have been, they have been midwives, they have been um, imbued with power that they brought over with them from Africa, through the Caribbean, to the American South. And if you recall in the book, when the twins were born, um, Adele had her fortune told, and Madame Thoreau recalled Marasa, the sacred goddess who united heaven and earth. And this is Marasa's symbol over here, the two snakes that are intertwined. And um, remember that the book is set in Mallard, which is only a couple of hours outside of New Orleans. And of course, New Orleans is a home to voodoo and hoodoo. And so as much as we see here though, beyond midnight, Beyond midnight is another vernacular term um, 
that is not at all a compliment. It's a term that is applied to very, very dark African Americans. If someone says that someone is beyond midnight, it means that they are very, very, very dark. And so what Betty Starr is kind of saying is like, well, in your face with that, she has portrayed this incredibly strong woman. She's given her all sorts of symbols of power and um, she's just gazing out at us with great, great calm and great power. And I think back to, you know, poor Jude, when she, you know, tried to use the, um, the Natalina to make herself Natalina Light. And um, I also recall when, when Jude and Kennedy, um, right after the play, um, they're standing out on the sidewalk as they, they kind of like, you know, end their relationship. And Kennedy, you know, her last comment to Jude is, well, your men usually like the light girls, don't they? So it's just, it's just kind of a theme that runs throughout. And here's a picture of Betty Sarr. And she was born in 1926. So she's 95 years old and she is still active. She had a major retrospective right before the pandemic. And uh, she has two daughters, Leslie and Allison, who are both artists as well. And uh, she's always been a strong, strong um, supporter of women of color and women artists and getting more women representation in museums. Now, let, let's talk about gender fluid thing. I mean, I'm, let's talk about Reese and let's talk about the exploration of, of gender. And let's look at this piece, Something You Can Feel by Michaeline Thomas. And what do we have here? Talk about a strong, confident woman so again, I wish you were down at the museum with us because you would see that this is a huge piece. It's about nine feet by 11 feet and it's made out of sparkles and um, glitter and rhinestone and fabric and all sorts of pieces put together. All right, and this was made by Michaeline Thomas who is um, an outwardly gay woman and this is her mother. Her mother was um, a fashion model. Uh, she appeared on the cover of uh, magazines like Jet and Ebony and Essence, and she made TV commercials and she appeared in a film. And um, she just, when Michaeline made this, she just evoked all of her memories of growing up in the 70s and 80s um, and going along on fashion shoots to her mother. And again, if we were down at the museum, you could see that this hassock here that this woman has her feet on and look at those shoes oh, with their leopard skin soles. This plays tricks with the perspective because it kind of moves in and moves out while you look at it. And all the different um, cushions and the fabric on the couch. And every time I tour this at the museum, people tell me that, you know, they used to have this wood paneling either in their basement or their grandmother's basement. And a lot of people have told me that they're pretty sure they had that couch down there as well. And um, here we just, it just, Michael and Thomas is just exploring different expressions of black identity. And she chose her mother fittingly to be the model for this. And here we have a photograph of Michaeline that was taken in 2014. And up at the top, there's Mama Bush, Sandra Bush. And uh, you, you, can, you can see what an elegant, elegant woman Mama Bush still was in 2014. Here is another artist who plays with sexuality and gender. And this is Kahindi Wiley. And what do we have here? Look at this confident African-American gentleman who is just, he's riding this rearing stallion, this, this wild beast whom he's got just completely under control. And look at the general, he's just gazing out at us with such pride. And he's holding, holding his scimitar and um, he's got his, I mean, he's just, he's, he's got on his undershirt and he's got his jeans on and he's wearing his Timberland boots and he's got his jacket slung over his shoulder and what is going on here? Well, this is Officer of the Hussars. This was painted in 2007 by Kihindi Wiley. And that name might be familiar to you because Kihindi Wiley is the individual who painted 
President Obama's official portrait that now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Um, but back in 2007, Kehinde Wiley, um, who is a classically trained artist, uh, went through um, Los Angeles, and um, he had noticed during his training that every time he looked through the standard art books, that there were no black faces. And if there were black faces, maybe in a crowd or something, they were never named. Maybe they would be like considered servants or envoys or something. And he missed the black presence in these paintings. So what he would do is he went out into neighborhoods that had large populations of people of color, and he would invite people to come back to his studio. And he would have them look through the classic art books and choose a picture that resonated with them. And then he would take photographs of them and he would create paintings like this. And this is 12 feet by 12 feet. It's almost a perfect square. It's huge. And Cindy Wiley, um, controls all aspects of it. He makes his own frame. He um, kind of puts that background, those vines, which some people say remind them of the designs that you might find on Versace scarves, you know, as they wind around. And as you look, you can see the vines. Sometimes they change the perspective. Sometimes they're in front, sometimes they're in back. And this is the painting that the individual who appears in Officer of the Hussars by Kehinde Wiley chose as the painting that spoke to him. The original, uh, excuse me, the original Officer of the Hussars was painted in 1812 by Theodore Jericho. And um, the Hussars were Polish mercenaries and they were cavalrymen. And they were known for being flamboyant and ruthless and proud. And so here we have the two paintings. Unfortunately, we don't own the original. That's in the Louvre, and they just won't give it to us. Um, but anyways, you can see what Hindi Wiley has done here, both to elevate um, African-American and to give them a place in history, to, to give them an idea. And here is Hindi Wiley himself. Um, he is a gay man. He is currently in Africa. He um, has established uh, workshops. He has done all sorts of things, like some of the earlier artists we were talking about today. He, too, is all about promoting the careers of um, individuals, people of color, coming up artists, and, and making sure that they get a way to share their art with them. And this is our last piece that I'd like to talk about. And what is going on here? Well, if we were at the museum, first of all, you'd be knocked out by the sheer size of this. This is about 14 feet by 18 feet. You would also be surprised because this is another collage. The two figures that are on there, they're actually wearing binti cloth. And binti cloth is a type of cloth that is made by uh, people who currently live in modern day Mali and it's cloth that is brought out for special occasions such as um, a birth or to celebrate a wedding. And they're actually wearing cloth. You can see here there's like a wrinkle where it's been glued onto the background, which is masonite, which is building material. Um, the two figures appear to be African, but they have bright blue eyes and they're connected together by a rope. This is an actual rope hanging off of the, the, uh, the, the collage. And what are they doing? Well, they seem to be wrangling with some animals. We have a very long serpent here who pretty much goes throughout the entire painting. We have some kind of a cheetah or a cougar down here. We have a giant mouse over here. We've got kind of a, a centipede, and then there are some other bugs and other animals throughout this. So this is Noah's Ark Genesis, and this was painted in 1984 by Charles McGee. And so I hope most of you know the story of Noah's Ark. It's from the Old Testament, um, the Christian Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and it's a story of rebirth, basically. God was displeased with how people were behaving. So he told Noah to build an ark and to take onto the ark 
his family, his sons and their wives, and gather up two types of animals, male and female, of every kind of animal on the, on the earth. And then God sent a huge flood, which washed everything away. So Noah's Ark, as I said, it's a story about getting a chance to start over again, getting a fresh start. And Charles McGee painted this in 1984, specifically um, in commemoration of the 1943 and the 1967 Detroit rebellions. Uh, as you can see here, the characters are having a hard time managing the animals. And the rebellions came out of hard times. But Charles McGee was also making the point that both of the rebellions gave us a chance to start over. So ultimately, this is a story of hope. He was hoping that we would begin again and try to do things a little better. Now, if you were down at the museum, I would point this out to you. This is a real bumblebee that actually flew into McGee's studio while he was creating this. And so McGee just kind of slapped him right into the piece and thought that he would make a great addition. And if we were at the museum, I would challenge you to find the bee in the piece. Um, I won't show you where it is, but I guarantee you that if you come down and take a look, you should be able to locate it. And here is a photograph of Charles McGee. And as you can see, he just passed away on February 4th. And he was a Detroit institution. Um, he wasn't born in Detroit. He came up to Detroit from down south. He was eight years old. He had never been to school. He had spent his life picking cotton. And he came to, um, eight years old, came to the Detroit Public Schools. They taught him how to read and write. And he went on and he had a fabulous career. Studio was in Detroit, lived in Detroit. And again, he was a true champion of artwork and young artists. And his artwork is all over Detroit. If you ever come visit the city, you can see it. He has mosaic pieces in the People Mover. He has got um, sculpture all over town. And he true was a true um, champion of African-American artists. So that concludes my presentation for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the connections I made to the Vanishing Half. And I hope you will all come visit us up at the Detroit Museum very soon. Thank you and bye-bye.